Have your Bibles, open them to the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to John. John chapter 9. And we'll begin reading in verse 1 for our scripture text. John 9 and 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now I want you to note the latter portion of verse 4, because this will be both our text and our topic. The night cometh when no man can work. Now I wonder what our Lord is trying to convey to us here. Now I know this gives the account, the record, the history concerning this miracle of the man born blind. But yet I believe as we study and as we dig into this particular expression that our Lord is not only giving a lesson here or there, but he's giving a lesson to us today. And what is he saying whenever he says, Night cometh when no man can work. Now here's the place that I don't want to be misunderstood this morning. Because I believe in evangelism. And I've often said at heart, I am an evangelist. And I believe that every pastor should do the work of an evangelist. And I believe the greatest work of the New Testament church today is the work of soul winning. But then on the other hand, Jesus said, Night cometh when no man can work. Night will begin to close in on us, and we will not have the opportunity to do this great work of evangelism. Now lest I forget, I want to give you another verse of Scripture. Over in the 24th chapter of Matthew. And here we find in verse 12. Listen to it. Matthew 24 and verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Actually our Lord saying because of abounding lawlessness, the love of many will wax cold. Now you that know your Bibles know that he's been talking about the things that would characterize the closing days of this dispensation. We'll come back to this just a little bit later, but certainly anyone who knows anything at all about the Bible knows that we're living in those lawless days. Every law of the universe has been and is being broken this morning. And then we go to another passage that I want you to see. Also, lest we forget, in the 18th chapter of the book of Luke, and here we find the Lord is emphasizing how that we should be persistent in prayer. But then in verse 8, he said, I tell you, nay, that he will avenge them speedily, that is, the elect. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on earth? Now you think about these three texts. Night cometh when no man can work. And because of abounding lawlessness, the love of many will wax cold. And then when the Lord comes back, and we believe that he is coming, will he find faith upon the earth? Now, some of the brethren laughed at me about my newspaper article, but I'm going to preach on it anyway. And you'll preach a little longer with a newspaper than you can sometimes with a Bible. Seriously now, and the only reason that I read this article and refer to many things in it in connection with the text that I've given is to show you what I believe personally, I as a pastor, you as pastors and evangelists, are up against in this hour. 
And I believe this morning that this group and other groups that we've been associated with at different times only represent a small minority. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not giving out the message of a defeatist this morning. I'm very optimistic. But I am saying by far the greater percentage of the American people and even of professing Christendom are going the opposite direction this morning. We just as well face it. The night is upon us. Now this article came out in the Denver Post Sunday a week ago. And I want you to listen to it. Uh, the uh, heading is Bible Bells Rides in the History. Maybe because I'm a rebel, it stuck in my crawl like it did. Come on now, you can't smile or say something. How many Yankees we got here this morning? Let's see your hands. Well, I'm pretty well at home. How many rebels? Let's see your hands. Well, praise God. Stay with me. All right, now let's look at it. And I want you to listen closely. It defines what I've already said. And as I said, the reason I give it is because of the brainwashing that's going on with the people that we're trying to reach with the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we read the Bible Belt that gave birth to that old-time religion has faded with the dusty country roads on which the circuit riders once made their rounds. In other words, they're saying it was just a passing fancy. It was just a so much energy of the flesh. It was just so much fanaticism. And like all other fads, it passed. Brother, I've got news for such atheistic writers as this. It still lives. Thank God we still believe in old-time, old-fashioned, heartfelt Christianity. Now let's go a little bit further. He said, stretching from the lower Atlantic seaboard westward across the plains of Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma, the bell has been crisscrossed by interstate highways, invaded by industry, and populated by former Yankees. Now, the Yankees going south helped bring on the coolness that's down there. All right. Now, according to his article, I didn't say it, he said it. The face, now follow me, the face of the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm going to say more about this later, long a frightening image to a rural people, more likely to be swayed by the Ku Klux Klan than Europe-born tradition, has taken on a neighborly look in the eyes of millions of natives of the region. The term Bible Belt was popularized about 1925 by author H.L. Mencken to describe that section of the southern United States, now listen to this, which gave a literal interpretation to the hell, fire, and brimstone passages of the Bible. Now here's the danger. This is just one United Press article that appeared in the Denver Post. I know people get up in arms and say, well, they're liberal, they're modern, they're Catholic, they're this and they're that. But the fact still remains that the greater population of Denver reads these articles. And many people that come into our churches read these articles. And they're saying that hell is a myth, that it's not so. I don't know about you, but I think I do. I believe in hell this morning. I believe that it's just as so as Jesus said, and it's a place of torment. And I don't have time to dwell upon it, but we could give you the passages. All right, let's pass on. He said it was in this era, it was the era of the Stokes Monkey Trial. Listen to it. Of revival tents and strong suspicions the automobile was a passing fancy. There are still areas in the region where the approach to religion has remained about the same during the past 30 or 40 years. But these are more accurately described as pockets rather than a bell. The trend toward liberalism or openness, as many clergymen prefer to call it, is widespread. Now listen again carefully. 
even the Dixie-rooted Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the country, has begun to emphasize social action as well as its traditional concern for the salvation of the individual soul. Now say what you will, brother. The Southern Baptist Convention was born with faith in God. Even though they departed from the truth, Dr. L.R. Starber and other great men who instituted and established Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, were honorable men, godly men, and soul winners. But now we see the drift. And here are a group that's coming in, and I'll prove to you this morning, they're already in. A group of liberals and modernists that say the social activity of the church is more important than the soul winning activity. You still love me? And if a bunch of fundamentalists are not careful that our bringing in promotion of every kind under the sun in competition with the world to try to substitute the lack of the Spirit of God in their services, if they're not careful, they'll go in the same direction. I lost some amens, but I'm going to keep on preaching anyhow. All right. Now what else did he say? Young men and women from the farms have gone to college and met members of other faiths, had their horizons enlarged by study, taken jobs in the city, and settled in the suburbs connected to churches by pavement and not dusty roads. You see, our boys and girls have left our homes and gone into the modernistic schools. That's the reason I'm glad for your school here in Denver. But they've gone into the modernistic schools, and as a result, they have been so brainwashed that they no longer stand and contend for the things of our fathers. I was talking to Dr. Ramsey this morning. I believe if there ever was a time that we needed not a seminary, not a school of higher learning, but an old-fashioned Bible institute where boys could come from the plow handles, from the machine shops, from the great factories, and take the Bible and learn it, the whole English Bible. We need it now. I believe we're measuring this morning on minors. Minoring on majors, if you please. All right, let's go a little bit further. Now you listen to this. Trend reverse. Scores of thousands of families have moved south with industry in skilled or manageable jobs, bringing their own faith and adopting the changing the churches of their areas. The migration reverses and contrasts with that of rural Negroes of the south who go north in the slums to join swelling welfare roads. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on that too much. I'm simply going to say this. Now, of course, this atheist thinks he's got it all fixed up. But what he's saying, he accuses the northern people, or says the northern people are the ones that brought really the truth to the south, and opened their blinded eyes and all the trouble that the North has is the bunch of Southern Negroes that have been trained by Southerners. They've gone North and all the problems. You see how it is? Who was it? You yesterday morning talked about passing the bus, and there's a good illustration of it. Well, so much for that. I see I'm not going to have time for my whole article, but I want to go a little bit further. And here we find United Press, Press International Reporters learned the facts of the change in scores of interviews. Now listen to this. Here comes in the layman and the clergyman of all faiths throughout the region. And their answers were things are looser, said one Baptist layman, and more comfortable. Let's say we're no longer seized in by the bell, but braced and suspended by church life more proper to our time. Now, who said we were supposed to trim our sails to the a time to which we live? 
Who said that we were supposed to enter in? Now, brother, there's a lot of things that I want. Uh, I mean, the latest model. I'd like to have a latest model automobile. I like the latest architectural schemes and plans for homes and buildings and what have you. But brother, when it comes to Christianity and salvation, give me the old time, old fashioned, heaven sent uh, salvation. Just like our fathers knew it. And just like our fathers stood for, not only in the South, but thank God in the North as well. All across this country, men who loved God and men who would dare to seal their testimony with their own blood. Well, now that's not all. Look on down here. Here is another preacher, and he says there is an increasing awareness of the need to make the church responsive to the needs of society. We are more ecumenical, there's that word, than we have been. To put it bluntly, I think denomination will be less important in the future. And you Bible scholars know that that's the, that's the purpose of this whole ecumenical thing. To completely wipe out all known church groups as far as that's concerned. To stand with their one head that ecclesiastical power that's represented in Revelation 17 and 18. All right, let's go still further. Look here, another Baptist preacher said, there's less interest in saving the soul for some future time and more concern for the present time and the whole person. God have mercy. How contrary can we get to the Word of God? Why, this is the ideology of all of your social service experts that go around with their bomb and their adhesive tape and what have you, and always trying to cover up and modify of those cancerous sores of sin upon the human race. But what we need is not benevolent acts of society. What we need is a new birth, as Johnny Ramsey preached it last night to a lost and a dying world. I still say the soul is more important than all the rest of it put together. Night coming. Brother, here's an evidence of it. Night coming when no man could work. You're going to have to agree, brother. I don't know. But I've uh, traveled in revival work quite a bit. But in my case, it seems to me like it takes about twice as much effort to win that soul to Christ as it did 25 years ago. I remember when we could go out in a three-week revival campaign. And brother, that revival was the main attraction. We could begin to lay the groundwork and preach on prophecy for a week. Then we could go out and begin uh, to deal with the Christians and then bring the message of salvation and then stay and then cast them there. Hundreds would be saved. But what do you have this morning? You know what I'm talking about. But I'm still not through. I'm going to skip quite a bit. But I want you to get this. Four miles north of Atlantis, Episcopal Cathedral, and a modern office dominated by the large reproduction of Salvador Dow's crucifixion, reporters found, now you listen to this, the Reverend William L. Self, 37 years of age. His Wamuka Road Baptist Church began with a plot of land donated by another church. And 350 families who volunteered for the city type mission. This was in 1954. Today it has 2,200 members, a budget of $441,000 a year, and plans for a $2 million sanctuary. Now, the still of self speaking, here's what he said. There is a strong element of young, educated, God have mercy on them, articulate, open clergymen staying in the Southern Baptist Church despite the folksy ways of others, but keeping in the mainstream of religious thought, self said. 
And then he goes on to say it won't be long until some of those old ones will die. Listen, let me tell you something. Somebody said the other day, well, you belong to the old school. I admit it. You're a cantankerous. You don't know how cantankerous I am. But brother, I'll tell you. As long as God gives me life and breath, I'm going to contend for the faith of our fathers. We've got too much uh, trimming of the sails now. Now, to prove it, I wish, and I don't like to refer to a man unless I uh, know his name, and I had his name down. We discussed it last week in Fort Worth. But how many of you have ever heard, and I don't like to refer to him because of the tragedy that came in his life, W.S. McBurney, the junior. How many of you know of him? You know his old dad. His old dad was a fundamental preacher. You know about this. And W.S. McBurney was saved in a fundamental church. He had a fundamental message and pastored the large Trinity Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas. We had him in Big Spring, and I remember how he stood and how he preached to close with the power of God. And if you would have told me that six weeks later the sordid story that came out of his life would come, I wouldn't have believed it, but I still loved W.S. McBurney. My Bible tells me I still loved him, rather, tells me to pray for him. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. Here was a church that had the premillennial truth preached to it. Here was a church that was a soul-winning church. And in that meeting in Big Spring, Texas, W.S. McBurney said, we have raised now $700,000 to build our new sanctuary with. They had that money already in cash. To show you what kind of a church it was, Sam Morris was a member of it. You know Sam, don't you? And Brother Sam wouldn't be a member of a church that wouldn't stand true. But then, just a few short months ago, Sam told about this in your conference New Year's. Just a few short months ago, they called him Marsh to the pulpit. Sam Marsh withstood him ever inch of the way. Toning down all the cardinal doctrines of God's Word. And you know what happened a few weeks ago? The pastor, do you know his name, Dr. Ramsey? I want to say Dublin. But anyway, the pastor of the Trinity Baptist Church that was set up and organized, I believe, of the Lord. That pastor called in a Catholic priest for a session teaching and instruction. Yonder in the Loop 12 going around Dallas, Texas, stands the great Park City Baptist Church, supposed to be one of the wealthiest churches in all the Southern Baptist Convention. I preached on this same text, but another message, and used for illustration, up on the top, the cupola of that building, there are four plots, one on the north, one on the south, one on the east, and one on the west. And written down in the face of that clock are these words. Night coming. My, what a message that is. To give out to the teeming millions that travel up and down that thoroughfare. But just a few days ago, the pastor of that church invited into his pulpit a Catholic priest. And brother, you say what you want to the old Southern Baptist Convention's on the way down. And I hate it. I think of men like Dr. W.A. Crystal. I think of men like Dr. R. G. Lee. I think of men who stood for the premillennial truths of God's word, the separation of the church. But we see them now tottering on the brink of ruin. And they'll be drugged down just like others have been drugged down. Night cometh when no man can work. Now, here again, I'm just a little afraid, and I hope that I'll not sound like a pessimist. That's an introduction. I've only got 15 minutes for, for the message. But anyway, I don't want to be misunderstood. Night coming. What is our Lord trying to tell us? As we see these things and look out, remembering the text again, Matthew 24, because the lawlessness, lawlessness shall abound. I said a moment ago, every known law of the universe has been broken. The law of gravity, the moral laws, 
And I could go on and name them. The mantle law. Every law that's based upon the word of God that God inaugurated and brought him has been and is being broken this morning. And as a result of that, people are growing cold. Christian people are turning away from the truth. The scripture said they're running here and there with itching ears, hoping they can find something, and I'll read it if the Lord let me in a moment, to soothe their own tongue. Not a lie. People changing churches, thinking that'll get the job done. But I've got an announcement to make to you, brother. Changing the label on the bottle don't change the content. It's still the same. Now then, the text here in Luke, Jesus said, and he's emphasized prayer. Oh, he said that we should be persistent in prayer. And just like this unjust judge that did not fear God, a Mordecai man, because of this poor woman that came persistently and cried out to him and said, Avenge me of mine adversary, he avenged her of his adversary, of her adversary. But then he added, Shall not God also avenge his elect to cry on him day and night? Yet nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes back, will he find faith on the earth? And actually what he means there, will he find a living, active, productive faith on the earth? Now, do you still love me? What have we substituted for faith today? We talk about faith. Sing about how rich we are and then live like Paul. Amen? We say, now, God, you get off over here in the corner. I, I know you were all right, almost like when Langston Hughes. You were all right in your day. But we've got something else now. We've got a program. <laughs> we've got a promotional idea. Whew. This is deep water, but I'm dead water. <laughs> Substituting everything under the sun for power, but no power. Brother, I long for the church to come back to the book of God. Come back and claim the heritage that stirs once again. Now then, to back this up, and I'm not going over my time, but to back this up, over in 1 Thessalonians, or 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and verse 1. The Bible can say what I've said a lot better than I've said. And here we find in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Or he's saying the Spirit makes it plain. It is written down so plainly and so evident. Look now. That in the latter times, and these latter times have reference to this dispensation, and the closing days of this dispensation, watch it now, Tom, I would not argue this point. Brother, I believe he's saying some of God's own dear children. Some that have been saved, some that have been born again, some that have stood in the pulpit, some shall depart from the faith. Now then, brother, you've got to have something before you depart from it, amen? I never would have been able to have departed from this room had I not walked in it this morning. I could not depart from my home if I had not stayed in that home last evening. And so he said, in these days many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's the reason I said, brother, we need a Bible institute today that'll take this whole English Bible and teach it just as it is and give our boys and our girls something to hold on to. They're going to need it in the days that lay ahead. All right? Then he said, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Here's the tolerance of the day. Having their conscience seared with a hot arm. Now I'll ask you again. Do you love me? Now, I know I believe in separation of church and state, and we spend our time and we ought to bombarding communism, modernism, and all of those things we ought to do. Don't misunderstand. But while we've talked about uh, separation collectively, many have lost their personal 
separated states. Now, I'm, I'm not just trying to have some say, but do you still love me? I know whereof I speak. And God knows my heart. A lot of preachers sit in their living rooms and watch things on the TV screen that 25 years ago they used to preach against. Don't talk about the corrupt cinema cesspool of the world. Don't talk about bloody Hollywood. And then indulge in things like this. Honey. <laughs> I remember what my predecessor used to say. He said in my church, Dr. Springer, bless his memory. He said, you know, the trouble about television is that a lot of these preachers are trying to catch up on the past 25 years movies they missed out on. And I think he must have been right there. But they're conscience seared. Now what did he say? Powerless. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Anything to get a crowd. Anything to get along. Brother, I can remember when not only those things were a sin and a stench in the nostrils of God Almighty, but I can remember when divorce was a stench in the nostrils of God Almighty. Now, you can love me or not love me, but I still believe this book teaches and substantiates and says this. There are certain things that will not prohibit you being a Christian and going into the gates of glory. But as far as I'm concerned, there are certain things that will keep you from filling certain offices in the church and embracing the pulpit. Amen. Used to, we'd have evangelists come through from the prison to the pulpit. From the line room to the pulpit. From the prize ring to the pulpit. You remember those old days sensationalism. I said the other day, that could be changed now. From the pulpit to the divorce court. From the pulpit to the barroom, from the pulpit out thunder, or uh, even the schedule. Why? Oh my. I'll tell you why. Night coming. Night coming. The love of many watching gold. Many are saying, what's the use? Anyway. All right? I wish we had time for the third chapter of Second Timothy, but we don't. It's good. You know it, brethren. But look on the fourth chapter, and this bears out what I've been trying to say. 2 Timothy 4 and 1. Here Paul is giving a charge to a young preacher. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead in his appearing and his kingdom. I wish I could count here. Brother, we've got two men in a day that talks out of both sides of their mouth. A lie is still a lie in the eyes of God Almighty. This old beat the devil around the stump. You tickle me, I tickle you. Good Lord, good devil, all of that kind of stuff. God don't want any of that. Paul said to this young preacher, I'm giving you a charge. Look where your responsibility is. Before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior. And he not only said that, brethren, but he said, I want you to know judgment's coming. Amen? He speaks of both the second, uh, of the first and the second resurrection. He speaks of both here in this verse of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, that all Christians will stand before. And also he speaks of the great white throne, judgment bar of God. Now he says, you've got to reckon with God. He'll judge the living. That's, our, that's the same. He'll judge the dead. That's the unsaved. And his appearing. That's the time when the judgment seat will come into view. Thank God I believe, and I, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a premillennial, pre-tribulation, fundamental Baptist preacher. And I believe after the morning of the first resurrection, one of the first things that will come into view is the judgment seat of Christ. He reminded young Timothy of this. Then the dead. Later will be the great white throne judgment bar of God. Then he said, at his appearing and his kingdom. Now then, here's what I'm coming to. He said, Timothy, preach the word. 
Woo! Now I'm a shouting back. If you want to holler, you just holler. Don't look strange at me, brother. I've got something to holler about. Maybe you haven't. But I have. He said, preach the word. Not about the word. Not give an essay. Not give a book review. Preach the word. I'll dare say this morning, that's what our church is dying for today. I'm going into home after home. We had some come the other day and said, Brother Jack, I'm sick of study courses. I'm sick of training unions. I want the Bible. I want the Word of God. When are we going to come back to the book? Preach the Word. What else? I just well make the rest of you mad. <laughs> Be instant in season and out of season. In other words, brother, there'll be a time when they'll respond and there'll be a time when they won't respond. You know that, don't you, doctor? There'll be a time when they'll say amen and they won't say amen. But that you just keep on going. You know, a lot of times when the deacon don't say amen, the preacher lets up just a little bit. He soft tells. <laughs> well, you know, after all, Dear old Brother Jones, he drops in 50 about every other Sunday. Our sister Nell over here, we've got to get along with her because she puts in a good offering. Who said, Brother God won't count dollars and cents. And a preacher's not worth a soul that goes to his bread. Little heads on any part of the word of God for filthy lucre. Night coming, brethren. We'd better work while it's day. We'd better do something while we've got the opportunity. Can I say it again? Brother, this challenges me. I hope it does you. If there ever was a time that we should take our heritage and assume our responsibility and pray and believe God for revival, that time is now. Amen. All right, look. Instant in season, now of season. Then he said, reprove. <laughs> Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering and doubt. And young preachers, you listen to me this morning. And I know these instructors, Dr. Bryan and others, can instruct you far better than I can. But don't you ever get in the pulpit and impersonate anyone. Don't you ever get up there and take after somebody just in order to do it. When you reprove, you do it with the Word of God. It's not going to be easy. When you rebuke, you do it with the Word of God. When you exhort, you do it for the word of God. Now, why? Paul seen this thing. He said, For the time will come. Night comes. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You want me to draw your picture? Here says an old boy. Pastor gets up, opens his book, and preaches out of the book every Sunday morning, just like the preacher ought to. And some flip, you know, that don't care anything about the book or anything else, got hidden sin in his life, would grab his hat and coat and say, Well, I don't have to listen to that. And down in the door, I'll go over to another church. It's not sour grapes for me. Brother, if they want to leave, that's just one more deadhead I don't have to drag souls over on Sunday. I mean it, brother. Let him go. You say you're rough. Well, that's the way God made me. And here they go over to some other church. And one of these here pussy foot and fence straddling, sugar coating, cup and bull riding preachers. A pat him on the back. Sure, glad to have you, brother. Amen. And as a result of that, our churches are shot through with every kind of individual imagination. Now, you, this will be hard for you to believe. I had a man come not long ago from a church in Denver, and I knew the pastor. In fact, I've had this happen twice. I know more pastors. And I don't blame anybody for getting out of an old, cold, dead church that's not true to the Word of God. But these came, and I said, well, you better talk over your preacher. Now, I mean, brother, if there's anything that stinks in my nostrils, it's a sheep stealer or a man that would invite a thing like that. What I'm trying to say is he would turn around and do what God said to that old boy might not want to come into that church. Right. Still love me? Yeah. All right, let's look at it. And now I'm going to quit. I don't want to get in on Dr. Wells' time. I'm anxious to hear him this morning as you are. 
But he said the time will come when they will not sit there and endure it. They said, I'm just not going to listen to that anymore. I'm not going through with it. But after their own lust, their own ideas, their own theories, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But then he said, Timothy, watch thou no things. Make full proof of thy ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. My, it's been a joy to be with you this morning, and I appreciate it so much. Hope we've been a blessing to you.